Hi, I'm John Nash, and welcome to episode eight of Cafe UCEA. The principal story is a critically acclaimed PBS documentary portraying the challenges principals face in turning around low-performing public schools and raising student achievement. Released in 2009, it's an intimate one-year journey seen through the eyes of two principals, one only in her second year in the Chicago public school system and the other a seven-year veteran in Springfield, Illinois. Maureen Ryan, the television critic for the Chicago Times at the time of the documentary's release, gave it four stars, calling it an excellent and emotionally compelling television program. So the principal story is also a useful learning resource, and I'm joined today by Frederick Brown to talk about that. Frederick is a former teacher, assistant principal, and principal in Ohio, and a program officer with the Wallace Foundation. Fred led an innovative principal training partnership between Chicago, in Chicago, excuse me, between the Chicago Public Schools, Northwestern University, and the Office of the Principals Union. Fred's been with Learning Forward for five years, and among other duties, has the responsibility for the organization's annual conference. Fred, welcome to Cafe UCEA. Thanks, John, uh, and good afternoon uh, to you and everyone else. Thanks. So, Fred, you've been involved in taking this critically acclaimed documentary on the working life of principals, and you've shaped it into this learning tool for aspiring leaders, and it integrates video, conversation guides, field guides. You've even got a brief for policymakers. Uh, tell me how that all came about. Well, when the film was first released, uh, and at that time I was actually at the Wallace Foundation, and Learning Forward was asked to uh, create a learning guide that would enable people to have conversations around leadership. Because when this film was released, its original intention was to provide people with an opportunity to get a, a, get a contemporary view of the principalship. So, you know, the first guide was developed for the multiple audiences that you mentioned. Uh, and the idea was, as I said, you've seen the film. How can you extend the conversation back in your setting? How can we create a movement around leadership uh, that folks uh, who saw the film uh, might be a part of? And so it was really exciting to be uh, you know, a participant in that, from Wallace's perspective, working in partnership with Learning Forward. Uh, since then, we've developed this new guide, and again, that was developed uh, after Wallace asked Learning Forward to think about how do we do a couple, couple things. One, how do we increase the shelf life of the film, uh, but also how do we provide this learning tool, something that would be appropriate for pre-service institutions and districts and others who are, you know, doing the job of preparing principals. So that's how we got to the second guide uh, that we are talking about today. And the interesting uh, thing about this guide is when we were developing it, uh, Wallace had just released uh, what we affectionately call uh, the Wallace Five. It was their perspective on uh, the principalship and what are some of the uh, behaviors of effective principals uh, as they create environments for effective teaching and learning. Uh, and what's really cool about that perspective is it took into account Wallace's research, uh, their investment uh, in across the country around issues of leadership, uh, and that perspective was able to uh, get the language down into these five key behaviors. And so we made sure that the guide itself was aligned uh, to those five key behaviors. Got it. And so uh, when you say aligned, you uh, had shown me before some of the work you've done to take the work from Wallace and put it up against ISLIC standards and uh, even the draft standards that are coming out. Is that the case? I think I have a screenshot of that. I'll put uh, yeah. that up here. Yeah, so what's, yeah, the uh, 2008 ISLIC standards, which are, of course, still in, uh, in force right now, if you will, uh, are, were very clear in setting the direction for what effective leadership practice could look like and should look like uh, in schools across this country and beyond. And even as we speak, uh, in, at the end of 2014, uh, throughout this, that last year, there was a review uh, of those standards, which resulted in the refreshed standards. And what's interesting about those standards is they're currently under review. Uh, they were released uh, for public comment at the end of last year, 
uh, and Wallace and others, uh, CCSSO in particular, are taking a look at uh, the feedback that came from those standards. But in the midst of all that, uh, the Wallace perspective, as you'll see from this slide, connects very nicely to both the 2014 ISLIC refresh and the uh, 2008 uh, ISLIC standards. You know, as you look down that list, this vision of academic excellence on the Wallace perspective uh, connects very uh, simply to the vision and mission and the vision of learning that you see in the previous ISLIC standards. So uh, what the Wallace perspective has done nicely, I think, is it's just taken a lot of complex ideas uh, and put them down into those five key characteristics of effective leaders. So we used those uh, for the actual field guide. Really nice. Now, as I look through the materials on Learning Forward and what you guys do, I notice that the mission is to advance professional learning that leads to student success. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about how there are some examples of how this has been used effectively, particularly with regard to improving students' lives. How has the materials been put to play like this? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So when you look at the, the research and all the best practice around uh, school effectiveness, uh, and the research has really been consistent, we've learned that the number one school-related factor that contributes to student success is the effectiveness of the classroom teacher. So that's been consistently upheld in the research. And then the number two school-related factor is the effectiveness of the class or of the school principal. So we all know that we want effective practice from our teachers and we want effective practice from our school leaders. And we also know that uh, many uh, teacher and leader pre-service institutions are doing a great job of preparing educators. Uh, we know that a lot of districts have evaluation processes and other things that provide incentives uh, to help people become excellent in their craft. But the reality is you don't get better teachers, you don't get better principals without learning. Those educators have to engage in their own learning in order to become better in their craft. So that's where Learning Forward becomes uh, uh, what we think is a, a good partner around this work because our whole focus is on helping schools and districts, uh, states and provinces consider their learning systems for the adults. And uh, you know, when you align your practices and your policies and your work at the state level and the district level to support a learning system for adults, when all those systems are aligned, so then you move from a system where you have pockets of success, which we do have in lots of districts uh, where you've got some great teaching happening in school A, but not necessarily in school B, but you really move to where you have success permeating the district or permeating the schools across the district. And so I think that's what Learning Forward's mission uh, and our vision around this work allows us to help systems do, which is to create those systems of learning for adults and all educators within the system. You know, a lot of folks uh, pay attention to, you know, John Hattie's research. And one of the things that he says is uh, he talks about this notion of teacher collective efficacy as one of the uh, one of the behaviors that if we pay attention to that in schools, we're more likely to see impacts in terms of student success. Yeah. And that notion of teacher collective efficacy, those those tie in, that idea ties into our learning community standards and the standards for professional learning. So it all ties back to a system of learning for the adults. Are there spots in the documentary for those that haven't seen it in a while or not at all that that sort of notion comes through? Yeah, there's uh, there's a point in the documentary where uh, one of the pr one of the principals, and this is Teresa Dunbar, is talking to her staff uh, about some of the things that she hopes they'll pay attention to in the classroom with the children. Uh, and in this conversation, you could tell she's frustrated because uh, teachers aren't assessing the readiness, as she says over and over again. You have to assess the readiness, and so in the uh, the learning guide that we provide, one of the conversation points uh, that we offer is, so in what ways can you help teachers who are really looking out for their students and want to do the best, how do you help them develop sk skills around things like assessing the readiness? And again, when teachers come together and they collaborate around an issue like this, uh, when they look at what the uh, research says and what are some best practice strategies, 
when they get a chance to share uh, their best ideas around how to do something like assess the readiness of their students, and then if they're allowed to actually visit each other's classrooms and see what that looks like, when you put that within a system of learning, what you don't have are teachers sitting there alone thinking, well, how am I going to do this? You know, what are some strategies? Instead, you have teachers collaborating uh, and sharing their best ideas uh, and so that they can attack an issue like, you know, how do you assess the readiness of students? Really nice, really nice. I, you mentioned a minute ago about uh, the second wave of materials has helped to sort of extend the shelf life of the film. Mm -hmm. Although made in 2009, it still feels pretty fresh to me. But is there a, is there a time clock on this content from your perspective? Well, yeah, that's that's a great question. When we when I was at Wallace, I'll put my Wallace hat on for a sec, and sure. we were seeking a filmmaker uh, to help us uh, put this film together. One of the things that we paid attention to a great deal was a filmmaker who would create something that would tug at our heartstrings as much as our thought processes around what makes a, an effective principal. We didn't want it to be uh, some uh, documentary film that what people wouldn't find interesting or wouldn't find emotional. So I think when you create a film uh, that looks at what it really feels like in this job uh, and you can do it in a way where you you reach that emotional level that's one thing that we knew would increase the or increase the shelf life of this film we just showed this film at the learning forward conference in Nashville not the entire film but just a, a short segment and we invited one of our principals to join or to join me on the stage and I can't tell you, one, because Teresa Dunbar, who uh, was the principal who came uh, to the conference, just is emotional uh, in the sense that she can connect with people and you can feel her passion around her work, so emotional in that way. Uh, that was one of the most powerful moments at our conference. Nice. Uh, people love this film. Uh, they love it because it really provides, for those who are principals, it really provides an example of what their daily lives can be like. Uh, so I would say the shelf life of this film, as long as we have people in this role and doing this work uh, and facing the challenges that we know many of them face today, particularly in urban settings, uh, this film is something that will withstand the test of time. That's really neat. And it makes me think about uh, the work that's been going on in UCEA for the last two years or so to bring uh, amateur documentary film, if you will, into the program of the conference. Mm -hmm. uh, and those have been standalone in terms of a uh, small festival at the conference where people can have a conversation about what they saw. But I'm wondering, after going through this uh, almost from ground zero, what recommendations do you have for budding, uh, I'll call them, you know, independent amateur documentary filmmakers, sort of action research, action documentarians, mm. uh, who can take their film of something exciting going on or important or compelling in their school or the community and turn it into a training opportunity? What would you, what would you say to them that came to you and said, what lessons have you learned and what can you tell us to do? Um. I guess a couple of things come to mind with that question. First, as you're, you're shooting the film, some of the most powerful moments in this particular film are the ones, of course, that are completely unscripted. Uh, you know, the filmmaker really just followed both principals around, had conversations with them, but then followed them around as they just did their work. And things just happened. Uh, and some of the things that just happened and the way those principals dealt with those issues as well as the system principals and other educators in the school, uh, the way they just did what was best for kids. When you capture those raw moments, that's really powerful because those are the kinds of moments uh, that you can't, you, know, you wouldn't think to just talk about during an, an interview, uh, but they happen and then as you reflect on them, they become great learning opportunities for those who may step in your shoes at some point down the line. So the first thing I would offer is uh, let the camera roll and of course get all the permission you need to do that, but let the camera roll and capture those real moments uh, for educators. And then to make it useful, uh, if you were creating some sort of a learning opportunity around whatever it is that you've captured on film, uh, 
create it in such a way that it actually ties into what we know about good adult learning. Uh, so when we created these uh, materials, one of the things that we did was we, we paid attention to how long adults want to sit and listen uh, and how quickly or how important it is to quickly get their voice into a conversation and get their thinking uh, into a conversation. So our materials are structured in such a way that you may watch a short video segment or uh, have a few questions that you answer, but then you turn and you have a conversation with your colleague uh, or a small group discussion because that's when some of the most powerful learning happens. Uh, what, and that's what we've learned in, with our adult learning as well as uh, our standards for professional learning. Right, right. I think it's important to point out to folks that it's this isn't a matter of sitting down and watching the entire documentary and then oh. having a discussion. You've strategically selected clips that illustrate key points in the learning process or the development process of a leader that then can be used as points of discussion or, um, right? That, yeah, and so and what I would say is when you think about your learning design, mm -hmm. uh, there are different designs that may be more appropriate for different settings. So this whole notion of watching the entire film is something that we did do in one of our com at one of our conferences where we just pulled a group together. But our intention in that situation was to create awareness. Uh, so we we're at a very surface level. But to go deeper, uh, as you just said, then uh, yes, it's really important to pull these segments, have a, a deep conversation around those. Uh, depending on how this uh, resource is being used or resources someone else might create, uh, it might be part of a course uh, at a university. Uh, it might be a conversation that uh, an associate superintendent is having with a group of principals. It can be used in so many different settings. And so the setting and the goals, what you want to get out of the whatever the learning situation might be, I think are the things that would lead to the learning design that you would choose. So you've gone through this nice deep dive for a second generation of materials. Um, Maybe it's a little early to say where it goes next, but is there a new phase in your head where this could go? Well, when we created the, the, uh, the learning guide phase two, uh, what we were asked to do by the Wallace Foundation in this case was to, again, think about ways that the film could be used to inform even deeper conversations. Uh, and we made the choice at that time to align our guide to the Wallace Five. What's exciting that we just learned uh, at a meeting uh, at Wallace uh, several, uh, I think it was near the end of last year, was that Wallace was commissioning additional videos to be released aligned to the Wallace Five. So whereas before we were using clips solely from the film, some of which did an excellent job of illustrating one of the five key practices, some of which weren't showing the best example of that practice and action, but allowed for great discussion, now we'll have additional videos uh, that will be released that will provide that were shot with the sole purpose of uh, illustrating effective practice aligned to the, the Wallace Five. So I think what's exciting about that is we'll be able to take those videos, embed them within this resource, yeah. uh, and it just gives more power, I think, to the resource as a whole. And those are done with the same production values and... Uh... Oh, absolutely. So uh, I, I can't remember the station. I want to say WNET in New York. Wow. Uh, we'll be shooting these, so they will be done uh, to the same standard, yes. That's fantastic. So it's almost come full circle. You've got a, a documentary that is, stands on its own as a critically acclaimed piece of film, yet has rich opportunities within it to become vignettes for training, and then that success begets a new set of documentary work that will be even shot with an eye to training. So, you know, it's, it's very nice all around. Yeah, we're excited. And you know, our goal is to just provide these resources so that they can be used. Uh, they sit on our website. Uh, one does not have to be a member of Learning Forward to use them. Uh, of course, we'd love for you to be a member of Learning Forward, but you don't have to in order to use these materials. So it's our goal was to get this out there and uh, make them uh, free and accessible. Yeah, so where should people go? I don't have a graphic for the URL, but could you just, and we'll put it in the show notes so everybody can go find the materials. Could you just say where people could go to look at this? Oh, absolutely. If you go to learningforward.org uh, and you click on the top where it says publications, you'll see principal story. Uh, and when you click there, it takes you to the entire learning guide and all the downloadable PDFs that uh, accompany the guide. 
uh, you'll see in there a way, uh, it was like a, a facilitator guide, so you can get some ideas on how you might actually use these materials. So yeah, it's all available uh, and free to download from the website. That's fantastic. That's just great. Well, Fred, thank you so much for joining me today. I think that this is a great project, and I hope that uh, we'll see soon the new work that comes out from the stuff that uh, WNET will do. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm excited, and I appreciate the opportunity to share these uh, materials and share this information. So thank you, John. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, that's our show for today. CAFE UCEA is produced by the University Council for Educational Administration Center for Advanced Study of Technology, Leadership, and Education, or CASEL, at the University of Kentucky. Ryan Schubert at the University of Kentucky co-produced this episode, and an archive of this program, the show notes, and anything else can be found on the UCEA Google Plus page. So thanks, and we'll see you all next time. Bye for now. <laughs>